The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Is Canada neglecting its stewardship of the Great Lakes? Tonight, as part of our collaboration with the Council of the Great Lakes Region, we'll make an honest appraisal of whether this country is pulling its weight in caring for the irreplaceable watershed. Also, we'll speak to the filmmakers behind the documentary series Great Lakes Untamed, having its world premiere tonight on TVO. It's Monday, September 26th, and that's all ahead on the agenda. When the U.S. and Canada came together 50 years ago to sign the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, it altered a terrible trajectory of pollution and environmental degradation. It also bound both countries to an active stewardship of the lakes. With us now to consider whether Canada is doing enough to hold up its side of the bargain. In Evanston, Illinois, Cameron Davis, Vice President of GEI Consultants, who served as U.S. President Obama's Great Lakes SAR for nearly a decade and all in Niagara-on-the-Lake, Ontario. Kelsey Leonard, Canada Research Chair and Assistant Professor at the University of Waterloo and a member of the International Joint Commission's Great Lakes Water Quality Board. Environmental lawyer Mark Matson, who is President and CEO of Swim, Drink, Fish. And Mark Fisher, President and CEO of the Council of the Great Lakes Region, which TVO is proud to partner with this year to examine the state of the lakes. He's also a member of the International Joint Commission's Great Lakes Water Quality Board. Welcome to you all. Nice to be here. Thanks oh, for nice having us. Here. All right, so let's get us started. A question to all of you. I'm going to start with Mark Matson here. What would you say to folks who think the Great Lakes are just for swimming and recreation? Well, that's a good question. I, I think, first of all, I'd, I'd send them a membership for Swim Big Fish because we want people to think the Great Lakes are swimmable and fishable for sure. But obviously the Great Lakes are much more than that. They're the world's greatest freshwater ecosystem. They're the drinking water for 40 million. And I know Mark Fisher and others can go on. And there's such an important cultural component to our indigenous communities across the US and Canada. So, um, you know, I would say to them, it's a good start, but, um, and don't ever accept no swimming and no fishing signs on your Great Lakes. They should be clean enough for humans as well as wildlife, but there's so much more to discover. And, um, and it is a lifelong journey of discovery. And I really, um, I believe there's just, you know, it's the, the connection to the Great Lakes um, grows over time and that, and that more we connect to the Great Lakes, the more we protect and restore them. All right, Cam, I'm going to come to you with the same question. What do you say to those folks? Yeah, there's there's a lot more to the Great Lakes than just fishing and swimming. In order for those things to happen, we need to have ecological integrity. It's like saying, uh, you know, you want to be able to use your car, but if you don't service it, if you don't get the oil changed, if you don't engage in upkeep of your car, it's you're not going to be able to drive it. So fishing and swimming are are kind of surface uses that we think of, and they're amazing uses. I know I fell in love with the Great Lakes with my family, uh, you know, when I was a kid going to beaches um, every, other, every other weekend when it was warm enough, of course. Um, but if we do want to keep doing that, if we want to keep swimming, if we want to keep drinking the water, um, if we want the Great Lakes to provide jobs for our people, then we need to make sure that they're maintained, just like a home, just like any other kind of thing that we care about. Kelsey, same question to you. Wonderful. Yes. I, I think it's really important to recognize that the lakes themselves are, are living beings, they're living entities. And so that in and of itself, they have an inherent right to, to exist and to thrive and to not solely be seen as something for human utility and human benefit and use. Um, that's great that that is oftentimes how we form a connection with the lakes is through swimming or drinking or fishing, but they are so much more than that. And then when we also think about planetary healing and planetary well-being, they are vital to Earth's life support systems. So when we think about our current climate crisis, the health of the lakes or the lack of health of the lakes is directly linked to the climate impacts that we see every day in our communities. All right. Mark Fisher. Yeah, great question. Um, so obviously, when I think about the Great Lakes, uh, fishing and swimming is incredibly important. 
But when we look at the health overall, uh, I would argue that the while we've made improvements to the health of the Great Lakes, we've restored, uh, I think, some legacy challenges that we face because of industrialization. The Great Lakes themselves are still under tremendous pressure, particularly those lower Great Lakes like Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, Lake Michigan. You know, we still see significant issues in terms of, you know, combined sewer overflows and excess nutrients finding their way into the system because of, uh, you know, rainfall, but also because of, uh, you know, different agricultural practices. Um, we're still seeing the introduction of aquatic invasive species. Uh, new emerging issues such as the introduction of pharmaceuticals and other chemicals into our bodies of water, you know, plastic waste, plastic litter. So we've come a long way in addressing, I think, a lot of uh, legacy issues, but there are so many new and emerging issues on the horizon that really challenge the health of the Great Lakes. And in fact, the last, uh, the, the latest State of the Great Lakes uh, report that just came out uh, assessed overall the health of the Great Lakes as fair uh, and unchanging. And I don't think that that's anything to really be proud of as a Canadian. Uh, or as uh, you know, Americans who share this uh, this globally significant natural resource, um, you know, between both countries. So I think, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. And if you know, we get the health of the Great Lakes right, there's a significant economy around this region that can uh, flourish and obviously be more successful and more competitive. As as Cam was indicating, we've got a very rich marine commerce industry here that supports over 200,000 jobs, 100 million dollars worth of cargo you know, floats on the lakes every year. You know, we use our water for hydropower, for fueling our industries, but a lot of that can't happen unless we're treating our lakes properly. All right, Mark Fisher, I'm gonna stick with you here for this question. Uh, you talked a lot about some of the issues there. A lot of issues require a lot of money. Earlier this year, the Biden administration announced 100, over $100 million US in funding for Great Lakes uh, restoration. That was a project sort of closer in the Minnesota area. Are the U.S. and Canada making similar levels of investment in the lakes? No, I think Canada is unfortunately being eclipsed. It's being outpaced by our uh, by our American partners, and that has been happening more and more over the last decade. You know, right now Canada more or less spends roughly nine million dollars or a year in terms of its Great Lakes protection funding, uh, community grants to support different projects. You know, they're making some important investments in restoring areas of concern that are on the Canadian side of the border. But the, the funding has just been a real disappointment, uh, I think, to me and a lot of Canadians. Uh, we're falling behind on science. We're falling behind on restoration. I think we're just falling behind and just really trying to understand and care for this globally significant ecosystem. And I know that Cam can speak about the experience on the U.S. side much more than I can and why it's been so successful. Well, that's who I'm going to next. Cam, you know... I don't want to sing you, single you out, but I'm going to single you out. Um, <laughs> are your neighbors to the north dropping the ball on this? Yeah. Uh, yes, they are. C Canada, the Canadian federal government is dropping the ball, and they're dropping it in a in a. They're fumbling the ball even. Um, and I don't say that to uh, you know to to not acknowledge all of the ways in which the Canadian federal government has played a leadership role in many instances going way beyond what we in the U.S. have ever done. Um, but in this instance, one way that we can restore and protect the Great Lakes, we have to, is by making a financial commitment to that. <clears throat> without the investment, without the money, all of the other things are just kind of words. And here in the U.S., we're up now past a half a billion U.S. dollars. And what you just heard from Mark Fisher is that Canada is at about 9 million Canadian. That is uh, a world of difference, and it means a lot. It makes a big difference when uh, investments are so lopsided. So we need Canada ca to catch up and to catch up fast. All right. Mark Matson, I want to get your take on that as well in terms of where Canada stands with the level of investments. Are we dropping the ball on this? It, well, I agree um, with Mark and Cam on that. I mean, Canada hasn't been stepping up and really living up to its reputation as the greatest defender of the Great Lakes. No other country can really claim that. I mean, the United States with the eight states involved, um, you know, there's a lot of different political jurisdictions. But in Canada, um, you know, our federal government 
Um, and fresh water, it's such a global, we have such a global res, um, reservoir of fresh water and the Great Lakes, 20% of the world's surface fresh water. Canada needs to step up and money's a big part of that. We have all kinds of projects, restoration projects that haven't been finished and new projects, um, community initiatives that need to be led in order to collect the data to do the work to protect it going forward. So I think Canada's getting the sense now that they need to um, address the Great Lakes issues more um, than they ever have in the past. And I think they're looking, and I think, and I, and I really think we're going to see some changes in the future. But right now, it, I don't know if it's been the last five years, 10 years, 20 years, but it certainly seems like Canada has not stepped up to the plate for the Great Lakes um, um, financing and, and, and investments. Kelsey, I see you nodding. I want to get uh, you to weigh in on that as well. Yes, I agree with everything that my panelists have shared so far. We really do need more investment from the Canadian government, particularly for uh, First Nations as well. Uh, we see that, you know, of those dollars, the community grants that were mentioned earlier, they often significantly go towards non-Indigenous governments, so to municipalities, to pr provinces, but we're, we're not really seeing it there be an equal distribution or a comparable distribution to First Nation governments in the same way that we see access to those similar types of financial resources on the U.S. side through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. So there is a substantial amount more resources available for tribal nations than there are for First Nations in working to protect the lakes, of which they are usually those on the front lines facing the direct impact when the lakes are degraded or polluted. So really just wanting to see more investment overall from Canada to make up for that. Kelsey, I want to I want to stick with you here. Um, how can we say that Canada is concerned about the lakes with the level of financial commitment, which we seem to unanimously say is not enough? Um, then we're seeing. How can we say that we are so concerned when when the dollars don't match up? I don't know that we can. That's probably a very easy answer. Um, I don't I don't know that we can say that that Canada is concerned. Um, I think that. It is now, hopefully, through these conversations, will become more apparent to both the, the federal and provincial governments that they need to put more resources towards uh, science, towards restoration, towards conservation efforts for the lakes. Um, and in particular, that there need to be opportunities for collaboration, partnership, um, and often, in some instances, maybe more so than, than not, uh, direct-led Indigenous conservation efforts for the lakes. We have, you know, millennia of knowledge and applied science in these spaces and territories, and so why not uh, get a higher return on your investment by putting those dollars with people who know what to do with them? Mark Fisher, same question to you in terms of, you know, it must be frustrating in terms of the amount of advocating, the amount of uh, pressure that you guys are putting on, on political government to get stuff done, but the dollars aren't saying much. And I am curious in terms of how this money is being spent. Where, where exactly are we seeing it go? Well, it is disappointing, I think, in terms of my advocacy, I often remind both the federal government and the Ontario government that uh, one in three Canadians live in the Great Lakes Basin. You know, 40% of Canada's economic activity is uh, is based here. Um, they call the Great Lakes region home. And so, you know, focusing on the Great Lakes, focusing on this region is, you know, makes good ecological sense. It's also good economic sense. And for the life of me, I don't understand why we don't have a more robust strategy, robust approach when we think about um, how do we improve this region's long-term economic success and sustainability. You know, when it comes to the funding right now, uh, some of it is going to science, uh, which we need to be doing a heck of a lot more of to understand those emerging challenges I talked about earlier, including a rapidly changing climate. Um, you know, and it's going to these community grants um, and these community projects that are doing important restoration work uh, and projects around uh, the Great Lakes coastline, but we're just not doing uh, enough in terms of the the, the sheer uh, scope and scale uh, that it needs to be done on to truly protect uh, the Great Lakes region, whether it's nature and biodiversity or, you know, again, you know, making sure our beaches are clean. Uh, all of that community work and that citizen science is being supported by these very limited grants that are available. So, um, you know, and obviously we're doing a little bit around, uh, you know, cleaning up areas of concern, but these areas of concerns have been around since the 1980s. And it's now that we need to, now it's time to start delisting these areas of concern and really getting back uh, these, uh, giving back to these communities that have had these industrial uh, hotspots 
and uh, reimagining what these places are going to be like for the future and uh, really leveraging that investment and turning them into livable spaces. Mark Matson, I'm going to come to you. You know, it's Canada has invested in the Great Lakes, but more money is always needed. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how some of that money gets used with uh, your organization, Swim, Drink, Fish. Sure. Uh, and Mark just touched on it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we've been doing a lot of community initiatives, community engagement around um, uh, water quality monitoring, community-based water quality monitoring. We've worked with uh, Zibasing First Nation, some other First Nations organizations as well, so that they can um, also collect the data that we need. And there's traditional ecological knowledge, but we do a lot of the science stuff, Western science, and collect one of the things we collect is bacteria and um, E. coli. And so we can publish that data every day so the public knows if the water's swimmable. It's a big question. It's the number one question we get at Swim Drink Fish is, can I swim in Lake Ontario? <laughs> can I swim in the Great Lakes? And so that's easy. I mean, government needs to invest in that. If they don't want to do the work, they need to get the communities out there because those answers are easy to discover on a regular basis and a daily basis. But beyond that, there's so many other groups out there I know data stream, um, water rangers, community initiatives that are being led at the grassroots to get um, those, to get the community involved and the volunteers and get the data and the science that our scientists and our government and our politicians need to make much, uh, you know, bigger decisions about where they're going to invest money. So I'm excited that they're investing in community monitoring. I think they need to expand it. And I also just think just really quickly, you know, we need champions. Um, the indigenous communities have been champions of the Great Lakes. But I look to, you know, our governments and I fail to see the same sort of champions for the Great Lakes. I don't see um, who's out there talking about the Great Lakes at the United Nations, who's out there talking about the Great Lakes in New York or in Washington. Who is our champion that's really going to talk about it as the greatest, you know, freshwater ecosystem in the world? And I think there's a lot we can learn from our from these communities, um, particularly the indigenous communities, about the importance of the Great Lakes and how to talk about them globally so that the funds that Canadians are using to protect the Great Lakes are really invested in, um, in the right people and in the right projects. And I'm excited about it going forward, but there's so much work on that. And we need, we need that advocate um, politically to really champion the Great Lakes um, at home and around the world. All right, well, I'm going to get Cam in there as well. Uh, you know, in terms of the, the concerning amounts of, of financial commitment, does that also have to do with sort of, you know, the number of cities uh, that are sort of uh, on the shorelines of, of the Great Lakes there? Yeah, you know, I sometimes find that, um, that you know, and I say this as, an, as a local elected official myself, you know, we like to play hot potato with who's responsible. And so, you know, one thing that I think is important to remember is we need all of these jurisdictions at the table. You know, we need a strong Canadian federal investment. We need the provincial investments, just like the states need to be at the table for investments, municipalities as well. And when you start to hear, well, you know, what's, we, don't, we don't put as much money into restoring and protecting the Great Lakes because – after a while, it starts to sound like an excuse, and there is no excuse. All of the jurisdictions need to be weighing in using our tax money, you know. So, I mean, this is – we're funding it as, as citizens in, in, both, in both Canada and the U.S. We're saying we want you to spend our money on this. We want you, our governments, to represent us by investing in this way. And the other thing I'll say, uh, Jan, is – we tend to think about the work that needs to be done for right now. I want to swim this year with my kids. I want to fish this year with my friends. But we need – these investments have to do far more than this. You know, they have to – we have to bring our, our indigenous uh, friends and allies to the table a lot more than we've done. But we also have to be looking way into the future, much more than we've ever done. And we have the data to be able to do that, to do forecasting, to make sure that we're restoring and protecting the Great Lakes, not just for this year and next year or the next five years, but for the next 500 years, the next thousand years. We need to do that because the Great Lakes system is changing. And if we don't make these investments in a future sighted way, the Great Lakes are not going to be able to support us. And that's that's my biggest concern. All right, let's talk about uh, some of the, the political players here. Uh, Mark Fisher, I'm going to come to you. Uh, obviously, you are there for the Great Lakes Public Forum. 
Will both the federal and the Ontario ministers, environment ministers, attend the forum? I believe the federal minister is attending this week. Uh, I don't believe the Ontario uh, minister is attending due to schedule conflicts. But this is a big event. Um, I think there should be representation uh, federally uh, from the Ontario and Quebec, from each of the eight Great Lakes states at a highest level. Um, you know, obviously, citizens need to be here, NGOs, uh, academia, industry. It needs to be a much bigger and well-attended event than it is, uh, particularly uh, from, a, from a policy and political standpoint. Kelsey, as uh, Cam had mentioned, there is no excuse. And I want to I, I wanna get your take on what kind of message uh, does that send, that their absence uh, at, the, at, this, at this forum? Well, I think their absence indicates the level of commitment and value system that they have towards the lakes. Uh, I think to you know to what Mark Fisher said earlier, this is a, a massive event and commemoration in recognition of 50 years since the signing of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, and it would have been wonderful to see heads of state here, you know, to see the Prime Minister, to see the President of the United States here, and valuing this and you know this massive ecological system that's important to um, our our. our overall climate well-being. You know, we just finished the New York Climate Week at the UN General Assembly this past week. What better way than to have these heads of state come here, commemorate it, and also make a commitment to reimagining the transnational and international agreements that we have for stewardship of the lakes. Um, and what I mean by that is to actually have made a commitment during this public forum for the inclusion of Indigenous nations, both Tribal Nations, First Nations, and Métis, to be signatories of a revised and reimagined agreement for the next 50 years. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. All right, so a question to all of you. Um, I want to hear some specific actions you'd like to see taken by at, when we talk about all government levels, federal, provincial, municipal, uh, to protect the lake. I want to start with uh, Mark Madsen. Well, thanks. And just, you know, what happened today in Niagara on the Lake, like the, the leadership that did show up, and it's one of the important things we need to go going forward is governance and including um, the Indigenous leaders from around the Great Lakes on that governance and those agreements. And what happened today at the Great Lakes is, you know, some of the most, um, the highest serving, most respected Indigenous leaders came to Niagara on the Lake today and did a, a water ceremony. Um, you know, to welcome the public to the Great Lakes Public Forum in the 50th anniversary. They also, you know, talked about the different wampum belts and um, and and did a dedication of a canoe um, uh, um, as part of sort of a reminder of reconciliation in the history of the Great Lakes. And we have incredible leaders um, from the Indigenous community who are coming this week, um, who came today. And and what uh, what makes me sad and disappointed is that many of the other leaders um, provincially, federally, across the U.S., New York, the eight states, you know, they're not here. And, you know, President Biden and our Prime Minister Trudeau aren't here. And it's the 50th anniversary of the signing of Richard Nixon and Pierre Elliott Trudeau. They saw how important it was in 1972. And we've had a few agreements changed a bit in 78, 87, and 2012. But this is a really important time. 50 years ago, we set out to restore the Great Lakes, and here we are looking to the next 50 years, which are probably more important. We've made some progress, but everybody here would agree the decisions for today moving forward are so important. So we need to invest in better governance, and we need to get our politicians' attention, um, including the Indigenous communities in those agreements. We need more investment. We've all agreed on that today. And I think for our organization and for a lot of other groups, it's it's getting the community involved. It's getting people connected to the Great Lakes, getting them into the water's edge, teaching them about how important um, the Great Lakes are to all of us, because the more they're connected, the more they're going to protect and restore and love these Great Lakes. And I think those, you know, that's where the funding needs to go into governance, into keeping the waste out of the Great Lakes, investments in keeping toxins out, and third, in building collaboration. Um, across the Great Lakes so we continue to work together um, because no one state or province or country can protect the Great Lakes or Indigenous community. We have to work together. It's a shared responsibility.
Uh, before I get to Kelsey uh, on on her take there, I, I do want to show, we do actually have a photo of uh, that uh, that moment that you were just talking about between President Richard Nixon and Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau shaking hands right after the signing. Obviously, a big moment. Of course, Justin Trudeau, the current Prime Minister, and President Biden won't be making an appearance at the public forum. But Kelsey, I want to come to you. If you had the table uh, to, to talk to all levels of government, uh, what would you be asking for? Oh, that's a big question. Uh, everything. <laughs> um, I, I think in terms of, no, but to be more more realistic and, and, and targeted and strategic with our approach, uh, one, as I mentioned earlier, is a reimagination of these treaty agreements and particularly of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Uh, Indigenous nations were purposely excluded from the original agreement. Um, we've seen amendments to the agreement uh, that have allowed for more engagement of Indigenous nations across uh, the two nations states. However, that still does not amount to signatory as a named party. And so that really is where we need to go in the future. As others have mentioned on the panel today, if we want to you know, protect the Great Lakes for the next 100 to 500 years, we need to ensure that Indigenous nations are signatory parties to whatever that protocol and processes may look like moving forward for the lake's protection. In addition to that, we talked a little bit about how uh, Canada is at a deficit in terms of their investment, uh, largely financial. But I want to just note one area in terms of political investment and, and redistribution of power that has been really impactful on the Canadian side, which is uh, the appointment of, of Dr. Henry Lickers as a commissioner to the IJC, hmm. uh, one of our first uh, Indigenous commissioners to hold that post. And so I, I think it's really important, on, at least on the U.S. side, that we see that same level of commitment in the future moving forward, that there is a commissioner appointed from a tribal nation. I also think it would be really great that at some point through a reimagining of these agreements, these transboundary agreements, that we see a reimagining of the commissioners and that there actually are dedicated appointments for tribal nations, First Nations, and, and Métis, so that we really do have a more equitable process and a process by which parity can be ascribed across decision-making. And then resources and money. So those would be my three things. All right, Cam, I'll get you in on there. Sure. Um, I think of I think of these things in in uh, in terms of the three P's. Uh, one is policy. Uh, we need stronger policies that are prevention oriented to make sure that damage isn't happening to the Great Lakes in the first place. So many times, if you look back at the history of the Great Lakes, at least modern history of advocacy, a problem happens. We react. We try to fix it. It takes decades. That dynamic has got to flip on its head. We have to identify our problems long before they occur and get in front of them. So policy is one of the P's. People is another P. We need the right leaders at the table, and you heard a little bit about that from Kelsey. Uh, could not agree more that it's time for our First Nations, tribal leaders, Métis, uh, to, to be very strongly in the mix of uh, the policies that we're creating. And then um, I always have a hard time finding a P, a word that starts with P for money and, and investments. So I go back to my law school days and I, I remember the word pecuniary. Um, but that's the other P. We need the funding, uh, enough of the deferred maintenance on the Great Lakes. We cannot keep setting aside and pushing down the road our obligations to help make sure that the Great Lakes are supported and functioning. Because if we keep doing that, the Great Lakes will not support us. They will not continue to act, serve, um, and, and function like they need to as the, as the healthy living organisms that they really are. And we have to be doing this in a far-sighted way. We have to be making decisions, you know, for the next 500 years or so. Those are the three Ps that I think are the key ingredients uh, to making sure that the Great Lakes are going to be around for my kids and their kids and their kids and their kids and so on. Mark Fisher, I'm going to ask you a different question here. Uh, Cam talked about support. I'm going to talk about the other type of support. In the 1970s, we had Earth Day, the Canada Water Act, and then, of course, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, all in the, all in the 70s here, all due to a large, massive public outcry that we needed uh, a more cleaner environment. Can we galvanize the public to move the needle even further on this conversation this time around, too? 
We have to. I don't think we have a choice. I was doing some rough math this morning, and of uh, Ontario's 124 electoral ridings, you know, close to 50% of them uh, share uh, part of the Great Lakes coastline. Um, these ridings are hugely important to these communities, not only in terms of uh, getting out and experiencing natural spaces in the environment, but also uh, how these lakes support those uh, local economies. Um, so we af we absolutely have to find a way of connecting and re-engaging with our citizens citizenry around uh, just how important the Great Lakes economy, the Great Lakes environment is to to Ontario and to to the broader region, and um, you know their voice is critical right now. Uh, and, and you know my my advice is that everybody in Ontario needs to be writing their local member of parliament, their member of provincial parliament, and and asking them to step up in terms of the the policies and the fundings that that Cam talked about. Uh, right now, we're we're trying to get the government to uh, to firmly commit to the one billion dollar. Uh, uh, commitment for the freshwater action plan that was in the last uh, the last campaign. It's time to do that, um, and and I think if we can, um, you know, this region will be positioned, um, you know, for the long term. That as Cam had indicated, in terms of getting the economy right, but getting the sustainable development and growth of this region right. If um, and so citizens have to be front and center in that conversation, and they're they're just not now. It's unfortunate I can't go through my itemized list of my wants <laughs> um, because I have I have many. Um, but uh, the citizens, getting uh, citizens engaged in this conversation is critical right now. Mark Matson, I'm going to come to you. Same question: How do we how do we move that needle? You, it, as well, I agree with everything said, but it's citizens. I mean, this is why we're here. Many of us at the Great Lakes Public Forum, and in 2012, they included the public and citizens in the um, in the Great Lakes Water Quality Board, and. I really think the more we connect people who began to the Great Lakes right across the board and take pride in the Great Lakes, that the politicians will respond. I mean, I always think of the Great Lakes as being the most important political, um, you know, center in North America. I don't think you can get elected as the president of the United States without the eight blue states. And certainly in Canada, when you take Quebec and Ontario, you know, their most important natural infrastructure is the Great Lakes and the drinking water. So. I think the more we understand it, the more we talk about it, the more we work together, the more the politicians are going to begin to respond in an effective way with money, um, you know, sharing governance. And, um, and really, for me, too, it's science. It's about, you know, we know so little about the Great Lakes and getting the community to collect data and have that data so the public get real answers about, can I drink that water? Can I go swimming there? You know, what's happening to our ecosystem? Can the, what about those birds who can't read the no swimming, no drinking signs? How are they doing? We need that science and that level of science. So I'm excited, but I think it all starts with community and people, and, and they're the hope for sure for the future of the Great Lakes so that our politicians will smarten up. Kelsey, I'm going to come to you. We talk about uh, the citizens and the people. Is there this perception that people don't care about the Great Lakes or don't care enough about the Great Lakes, and why? Well, I... I personally don't have that perception. Um, I think it's largely because of the wonderful work that we've been able to do through the Great Lakes Water Quality Board and through our Great Lakes Regional Poll. So uh, this is a public opinion poll we've run for three iterations now, 2015, 2018, and 2021. Um, and we survey over, you know, over 3,000 residents of the Great Lakes uh, by a phone survey. And then more recently this year, we also added in an online survey. So we have a really, really good database um, and data set of respondents. And overwhelmingly, um, you know, every sort of iteration of the poll, well over 90 percent of respondents say that they um, love the lakes, that they are, you know, wanting to see that they are protected and cared for and that we have policies in place that protect them for the future, um, not only for their own individual futures, but for future generations. And so uh, I think that if that myth exists, we are hoping to debunk it. Um, right now, citizens care, as my co-panelists have shared, they care a, a whole lot about the lakes. What we need to see is the action of politicians and government responding to that data from the polls that we've created to recognize that their constituents value this investment, and so they should be investing in, in these issues of concern. Cam, as the only American on this panel, I'm going to give you the last word here uh, in terms of, you know, what, what we can be doing to sort of move that needle with the public and, and get them to care. 
Mm-hmm. Well, um, I think it starts with helping people understand what needs to be done. You know, we need to punch the accelerator and get our toxic hotspots cleaned up. We need to make sure that our coasts are resilient. Um, to be able to withstand the pounding that they are starting to take under lots of different climate change scenarios. Uh, We need to make sure that we are safeguarding uh, areas around the Great Lakes that have a high degree of ecological integrity and that might be in jeopardy. We need to make sure that people understand the connection to why it, it, it really affects them to care about the Great Lakes. I'm with Kelsey on this. I, I have yet to meet anybody who doesn't care about the Great Lakes, who doesn't uh, want to see them protected and restored. Uh, what I, I sometimes see and hear is that people don't quite know how to do that. But uh, the electoral process is, is a key part of it, making sure that we are electing and reelecting leaders who understand that this is not a partisan issue. Um, people of all stripes want to be able to take their kids to the beach. They want to be able to drink their water. They want a Great Lakes that are healthy for the next seven generations. Um, and I say that wearing a whole bunch of different hats, whether it's a GEI, my elected position at the Water Reclamation District in Chicago, and formerly with the Obama administration. These are the kinds of observations I've, I've had and noticed in almost 40 years of doing this work. Cam, Kelsey, Mark, and Mark, thank you so much for joining us on the program tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. People in Ontario live on the shores of some of the most magnificent bodies of water in the world, but many of us know surprisingly little about them. A new documentary series that has its world broadcast premiere tonight on TVO offers some remedy to that. It's called Great Lakes Untamed, and we're joined now by two of the filmmakers. In Winnipeg, Manitoba, Merritt Jensen Carr, president and executive producer at Merritt Motion Pictures, and in the nation's capital, Ted Oakes, executive producer and owner and managing director of Oak Island Films Limited. Welcome to you both. Hi. Thank you. All right, so for 13,000 years, the Great Lakes have been home to a million creatures and supplied an economic lifeline for two nations. Let's take a look at a short clip from the trailer for the Great Lakes Untamed documentary. The Great Lakes aren't just enormous, they're ever-changing, unstoppable. These are the greatest lakes on Earth. All right, Ted, I'm going to come to you. You know, you'll learn a lot watching this documentary, and I want to know what are some gaps you're trying to fill in terms of showcasing not only the beauty, but the life and stories of the Great Lakes? I, um, I guess, uh, Jan, the, the main thing is that no one has done a landmark natural history TV series about the Great Lakes watershed. We see uh, these types of films about the Serengeti or the Amazon or other parts of the world, but we haven't seen them, uh, this type of uh, three-part high-budget uh, natural history documentary um, about this watershed and and uh, about the place where we live. So that's, uh, th- I think that's what's special about it. Mayor, I want to come to you. In what ways do you see this project making an impact, both locally but also internationally? Well, um, I think for me it was, it was a huge opportunity to be able to make a series like this with Ted and to bring all of his uh, BBC natural history filmmaking experience to Canada. But also, um, you know, we were able to involve broadcasters from around the world. And, uh, and our goal is to put the Great Lakes on the map internationally in a way that the Amazon is on the map and bring awareness to the fact that this body of water is incredibly important at this period of time. I want to ask you as well, in terms of time, a lot of people, uh, you know, it's it's a three-hour uh, documentary series here, but there is a lot of time and hours that go into making something like this. And I'm just curious, Mary, how much time did go into this? Well, three years, three years, but... Um, three years from development, TVO was fantastic. They were the first ones to get on board and help us develop it. But Ted has been dreaming about making this project for a much longer time, as he would tell you. 
Ted, let's let's jump into that. Let's talk about some of the inspirations there. You talked about, of course, you know, there have been all these documentaries about other sort of great regions, but what was it about the Great Lakes? What inspired really the the, the start of it all? I, I grew up in Ontario, and uh, when I was a little boy, everybody my age uh, was rolled out in school to watch a film called Paddle to the Sea. And Paddle to, to the Sea was made by an Ottawa-based filmmaker uh, who was nominated for an Oscar for that film. And it was all about the story of a little uh, indigenous canoe going through from Lake Superior all the way out to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And um, in 2014, I happened to be at a talk uh, just north of Ottawa here, and the canoe was sitting uh, in a display case, sort of on the side, uh, almost ignored. And I re remembered uh, the NFB film uh, Paddle to the Sea from the early 70s and thought it was time to do something spectacular about the Great Lakes. So that, that's what we've tried to achieve. Now, uh, Merritt had mentioned, uh, you know, that the Great Lakes have been compared to the Amazon. Ted, I'm curious, how... Are the ecosystems similar? I, I've spent quite a bit of time in the Amazon, and and uh, and, and, and a, probably about a quarter of my life in the Great Lakes watershed, um, both as a biologist and as a filmmaker. Um, they're 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 similar in a lot of different ways. They're vast areas of forest, a wetland, uh, with a diversity of habitats and animals. Uh, there are diversity of peoples. And they've also, both the Amazon has really shaped the consciousness of Brazil, and uh, and the Great Lakes has really formed Canadians. Remember, historically, the Great Lakes were the path for the settlers to come from Europe into the interior, and uh, also home to many First Nations uh, people in both Canada and the States. And so both countries have been shaped by these watersheds, both uh, politically, historically, economically. And the missing piece for the Great Lakes is that people haven't really appreciated the nature of the watershed, the nature that we have here. here. Now, Merritt, we know indigenous groups in the Amazon have been fighting to conserve uh, the rainforest and the resources there. I'm curious, how did you shed light on the importance of indigenous knowledge in this particular project? We were fortunate very early on to bring on Can Royal Canadian Geographic Society and swim, drink, fish as partners. And uh, RBC has come on board um, and funded a very large impact campaign. So the entire project is over $5 million if you include the film series and the education campaign. Um, it's um, the, the education campaign has incorporated um, a, a indigenous, it's, it's, I mean, Ted has had this idea, which I think is really important, that the indigenous, that they're really, there are no borders, you know, there, it's a, it's, um, and uh, the role that indigenous people have played protecting the Great Lakes and the knowledge of the Great Lakes hasn't been incorporated into our knowledge in the way that it needs to be. And so what we've done with this impact and education campaign is we've incorporated that knowledge. Um, also in the making of the series, we have in, we've involved indigenous scientists and indigenous researchers to the extent that we could. Ted, if the Amazon rainforest is the lungs of the earth, what are the Great Lakes to Canada and to the world? Well, the, the, the five Great Lakes themselves have 20% uh, of the world's fresh water, surface fresh water. This is wa water that isn't frozen in the Antarctic or Antarctic. And, uh, and if you include the St. Lawrence River watershed, which is the only river that drains the five Great Lakes, then we're looking at almost a quarter of the world's fresh water. On a planet that's short of fresh water, um, these lakes have never, and this watershed's never been more important. It is of global significance. It's as, as important as the Amazon to the to the uh, to, to planet Earth. It's as important as the Amazon to to all people of the Earth. But also, it's ninety percent of the U.S.'s source of fresh water, right, Ted? That's right, and and uh, there isn't really there's barely a drop of water west of the Mississippi in the U.S. If you zoom in to the Great Lakes watershed, um, as you get inland away from the five lakes, you see thousands and thousands and thousands of smaller lakes. But if you zoom in west of the Mississippi into the United States, you see almost no water, almost no lakes. 
So there's a big looming water crisis in the U.S., and uh, the Great Lakes have never, and protecting the Great Lakes has never been more important. All right, I want to jump into some of the challenges. Uh, that was a part of you know the conversation that you were covering in the documentary, uh, Ted. How is climate change already affecting the Great Lakes ecosystems and and the species? Well, we see this with uh, some of the uh, we, we see this in in, in in some of the scenes within the the TV series. Uh, in one of the episodes is about how the watershed was formed by by the powers of ice and snow. And uh, within that, there's a story of indigenous people in the U.S., uh, the Chippewa, on the Amer American side of Lake Superior, who are funding research into uh, moose tick, into uh, ticks that infest moose. And... What's happened on the U.S. side of the Great Lakes is moose have almost gone extinct. There's only about two to 4,000 moose on the U.S. side uh, of the Great Lakes. This is what's coming to Canada uh, uh, because with warmer winters, uh, they get uh, ticks, which they call winter ticks, which they try to rub off, um, which uh, cause uh, various problems for them. But one is they lose their insulation of, of their fur. And uh, so moose are likely to go extinct on the Canadian side, in addition to on the U.S. side, if we uh, don't uh, combat climate change. And, of course, moose is a wonderful animal. Um, I've seen them here north of, of uh, Ottawa, where I am now. And uh, and, and uh, we wouldn't be Canadians if we didn't have moose, or we wouldn't, uh, you know, we wouldn't be Ontarians if we didn't have moose. So uh, that's just one example. Merritt, I'll let you chime in there as well. Um, well, I'd, I'd just like to reframe it a little bit because um, we do talk a little bit about some of the challenges, but our goal was to celebrate the, that, that watershed, that entire watershed and all of the wildlife that exists there and depends on it. That's uh, uh, a lot of which is thriving. And I think that the public perception is that, you know, that the Great Lakes to a great extent are dead you know, are certainly, you know, in dire straits. But in fact, and they, they are, I think, you know, a lot of people are completely unaware of the abundance of wildlife that exists there, the diversity of wildlife that exists there, just how amazing it is and how much is left there to protect. And also how much success people are having with some of the uh, conservation efforts that are already happening. So, um, so that I just wanted to kind of make sure that the that people understood that's the series. This isn't a, it, this isn't really primarily an environmental series. This is a nature series, which is celebrating the Great Lakes and all of the nature of the Great Lakes. Um, and uh, and then in terms of challenges, I think in some ways the Great Lakes absolutely there are many challenges, um, but uh, including making the series, which was a real challenge during COVID. Um, but um, but but again, you know, this series doesn't focus on the challenges. It's I, focused on the we we will get to some of the uh, the species that are thriving, but I, I do want to pick up on that note. You know, in terms of the production side, when we talk about climate change, you know, there are some beautiful uh, scenes and shots that you guys have taken, and I think a lot of people don't really understand how powerful the Great Lakes can be. I, I want to get a, sort of a take, Merritt. You know, how did these changes, when we talk about climate change, affect production um, on the documentary? Um, well, the it's becoming very, very hard to make natural history because we used to be able to predict behavior and when behavior was happening. And we also used to be able to rely on the scientists that are studying that wildlife to help us know when we need to be into the field for you know, various kinds of um, you know, moments in that behavior. And, uh, and now it's really difficult for anyone to predict. Um, and so I'm making this series, you know, well, we had two challenges. One, because of COVID, a lot of scientists weren't in the field. And uh, so, and we couldn't cross the border. And so our directors had to rely on American, um, American shooters and they couldn't be in the field in the way that they would normally be. That was one really huge challenge. Mm. And then the other challenge was, uh, was, is just that, you know, we, we can expect that something's gonna happen at a moment in time based on historic experience, but that's, that's not reliable at all in the way that it used to be. 
and I, I mean, I think Ted could speak to that even more than I can. It's uh, it's become a huge challenge, and um, and that's not just for this show. That's been for the last, you know, really the last probably the last ten years, more and more the last five years. All right, so as the world warms, lake effect blizzards will become more extreme. The southwest, southeastern rather, shores of the Great Lakes will bear the brunt, but that is indeed good news for the Canada lynx, a, a master hunter in the deep snow. I wanna actually show uh, a clip of the Canada lynx hunting for a snowshoe hare. Have a look. Now, we don't want to give away too much, so you have to watch to see what happens there. Uh, but as you mentioned, that is just one example of a species that is has rebounded and has started to sort of thrive. Another example, of course, is the beaver population that has increased, uh, increased along the Great Lake Basins. Uh, Ted, in what ways are our watersheds in better shape uh, than they were just a few decades ago? Um well, certainly the wildlife. When I, when I was a kid here in Ottawa, there was heavy persecution of uh, native wildlife. I remember, I mean, I grew up right in the city here. I remember going across to the neighbors and he had five dead wolves in his garage, you know, and he was just a civil servant. There was a bounty on wolves when I was a kid. Uh, beaver populations were low. There was heavy fur trapping, um, sometimes just for a hobby. And uh, so there's far less persecution of the big mammals. And uh, that means that wildlife populations have, uh, of many species, especially the, uh, uh, many of the carnivores have, uh, have increased. And that's uh, fabulous news. I mean, it was almost impossible to see a fisher. There's a mammal called a fisher when I was, uh, uh, um, that lives in, in, in the Great Lakes watershed. Uh, it hunts porcupines. And, I'd never heard of anybody seeing a fisher when I was younger and when I was a biologist working for the Canadian Wildlife Service, but now people are seeing fisher all the time. Uh, mountain lions are slowly reclaiming parts of Ontario. Uh, so uh, many species are coming back that, that uh, were formerly heavily persecuted, and that's a great thing. Um, the, the Great Lakes watershed has almost the same diversity of large mammals as Yellowstone does. As, as, as the uh, some of the more famous places where people would go to see wildlife in North America. So it is our, you know, it is our Amazon. It's a fabulous place. I do want to follow up with you, Ted, on that. Um, you know, in terms of putting this documentary together, what was the process like in terms of figuring out what species you wanted to highlight, what species you wanted to, uh, you know, put some more attention to? Yeah, I mean, we did about six months of uh, intensive research before we started filming, uh, just recalling scientists, trying to find out uh, where there were new stories, where the, there were the best stories. And we found some spectacular things. Uh, there's a new research that flying squirrels are fluorescent and uh, communicate through fluorescence. And uh, you'll see that that's completely new science. One of the handful of mammals on the planet that uh, actually have bubble gum pink fur at, at night under uh, certain types of lighting. We, we found a species of fish called the red side dace that lives uh, in the watershed of Toronto um, that is a specialist. It's the only fish in the world, as far as we can tell, that jumps out of the water to catch insects on the wing. So it's a specialist in feeding in the air, and we filmed that. Uh, we filmed a variety. We found uh, wolves fishing in fresh water. They're the first wolves in the world that have been documented to be catching fish in fresh water. We know in BC that wolves will fish in the uh, coastal tide pools, but these wolves are feeding in fresh water thousands of miles from the ocean. So we tried to concentrate on completely new stories that would captivate the audience. And I think that really worked. I think in every part of that documentary, there are parts where you, you know, it's mentioned by the narrator that this is the first time it's ever been captured on camera, and it's really fascinating. I think a lot of people will learn some stuff. Merritt, you know, you had you had mentioned, you know, one of your goals was to share good news about the Great Lakes, and I want I want to come back to that. Why is it important that Canadians know the progress that we've made on that front? Um, I think I think that. Um, I think in order to engage people into feeling like action is possible, I think there's a real sense often that it's too late. 
And, uh, and so I, th I, th I think it's really important for people to see that there's so much that's working, you know, and so many efforts that are happening that are working and have been for a long time and that we're seeing the success of that. And that the important thing right now is to just, you know, expand that and increase that and uh, make, make more things possible. But it's, I, it's just, and then, you know, a big part of everybody's goal is to try to make sure that people are kind of enjoying the lakes. They're, you know, they're, our lakes to enjoy, experience, get out there. And, um, you know, we're really, we're really blessed to have that. And so, I mean, so that, that is, that is, I think the other goal is just to be, help, help people realize there's so much there for them to experience. Um, uh, and, and not just people in Ontario, but also people in the world, you know, because I, I don't think there's an awareness of the Great Lakes. And what we want to do is put the Great Lakes on the map in the same way that some of those other places, as, like Yellowstone, as Ted mentioned, mm -hmm. are on the map as a place that's there, that's, you know, where nature is thriving and, um, and uh, we should be part of it. Now, Ted, you are a zoologist, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the scientists that were involved. Uh, you talked about the, the months of research, and, and uh, Merritt's talked about the three-year production uh, time span here. You had scientists share their knowledge in wildlife, like the wolverine biologist, for example. Why is it important um, for people to know more about their work? I mean, the biologists are... I was a biologist for 10 years, you know, it, it, wildlife biologist. It, it, the, the biologists are unsung heroes. You know, they're working in remote places, poorly funded, rarely heard from. And they have amazing stories to tell about uh, the creatures, the fellow creatures that inhabit this vast watershed. Um, but without their research, we wouldn't really know uh, about the wonders of the watershed. Imagine going into an art gallery and having all the paintings turned to face the wall. What a biologist does is turn that painting over so that you, and telling you the history of, uh, of that painting. That's the, the equivalent of it. But in addition to the biologists, we had some of Canada's best cinematographers. We had uh, um, Nick DePoncier, uh, um, uh, Jeff Morales, uh, Hugo Kitching, some of the best cinematographers in North America, um, and, and a fantastic team uh, that were working uh, to working with the biologists to bring us these stories. And uh, Merritt and I couldn't be more proud of the work that they did. And we have a few minutes left, and I want to ask of both of you, um, Merritt, I'll start with you. What do you hope the audience takes away from this project? Um, I hope that the audience comes away realizing that um, the Great Lakes are this enormous um, a gift to Canada, that, that they should be treasured, they should be experienced and that they should be supported and that people are aware of the fact that it's time right now to step up and make sure that happens, that they tell governments um, that, um, that they want to make sure that those lakes are properly protected and funded and that they get out there and they enjoy them. Um, that's, uh, I, I really want to make sure that that kind of, that this series kind of uh, really inspires people to take that action and um, and understand what they have left to protect. All right, Ted, for people who want to get involved and learn more about the Great Lakes, why is this week super important? This is the 50th anniversary of the U.S.-Canada Great Lakes quality, uh, Water Quality Agreement signed by Pierre Trudeau and Richard Nixon half a century ago. And there's a conference in Niagara Falls uh, the public are invited. Uh, you can register, go online and register and uh, tell politicians on both sides of the border what you want. But people need to engage in the Great Lakes publicly. It's not just the five lakes. It's the entire watershed. It's almost as wide as the Atlantic Ocean from the western edge of Superior all the way to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. That is the watershed. And um, the, the people who have not been um, consulted about the stewardship of the Great Lakes are the Indigenous people. The many First Nations people uh, were never party to the original agreement. And they have an important, crucial voice uh, in this. So I really encourage people to uh, join the um, Royal Canadian Geographic Society and Swim, Drink, Fishes uh, monogamy campaign, which is really stewarded by First Nations people. 
And uh, that's the thing that they can do the best. But I, as Mark, as Mark Merritt said, just enjoy the watershed. Uh, as go swim, go, go drink the water, go fish um, where you can, and fight for clean water and fight for uh, nature in the watershed. That's what people should do. And we will leave it there. Ted Merritt, thank you so much for joining us on the program tonight. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. <laughs> And that is the agenda for Monday, September 26, 2022. Tomorrow, as part of our ongoing partnership with the Council of the Great Lakes Region, we'll find out more about what everyone can learn from Indigenous knowledge of the Great Lakes watershed. Now, stay tuned for the first episode of the world broadcast premiere of Merritt and Ted's stunning documentary, Great Lakes Untamed, which starts right now.